feeling that I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wouldn't mind a little more time. Yeah, I have to really simple. go through things. Be Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, November 17th, 2020 to order. We're gathered on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And today we have some delegations. The first one is from BC Hydro, Stefan Watson. And can I get a mover and a seconder? Thanks so much. And welcome, Stephen. Hello, thank you very much. So it's good to be here. I'm, it's the first time presenting in the uh, in this new chamber. Is it okay with the mask on, or should I take it off? Good. Okay. So um, I have presented to the board numerous times, but yeah, it's been a few years. So it's, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, our operations on the Pontlet River system and our capital projects. Yeah, they see. It. Oh. Yes, that worked. Okay. So just a little bit about the uh, the hydroelectric watershed here. So on the screen, uh, at the bottom, we've got the Comox Lake Reservoir, the Comox Dam. Uh, then we release water downstream to the Pontlidge Diversion Dam, so 3.7 kilometers down. And then uh, from there, water enters the Penstock, runs about five kilometers, that dot dash line to the powerhouse, and then goes through the generator turbine and uh, back in the river. And then we have a minimum fish habitat flow down uh, Nymph Falls, Stilton Falls, areas like that. And uh, of course, we have the Browns River, Solon River that feeds into uh, the Pullman River uh, all the way down to the Courtney Estuary. So the, the history is that the Denver Colliers built these, uh, the hydro, first hydroelectric component here around 1910, uh, BC Hydro took it over in the 1950s and, and we've uh, made it to what it is today. So uh, top left is the Comox Dam. It's about 300 meters from the outlet of the reservoir. So it's not within the reservoir, it's actually within the river channel. And uh, so we have two spillway gates and an overflow spillway when flows come up. Uh, and then on the right top is the diversion dam, which I mentioned where water enters the intake uh, to the penstock and, and our minimum fish habitat flow. And that's also the area where we release water for flood risk management. And then uh, the bottom picture is the Pontledge Powerhouse, generates about 24 megawatts and helps uh, keep the lights on in, in the Quinox Valley. So part of operations and maintenance, we wanna make sure the system is reliable um, and safe. So we have uh, work on the powerhouse, on the intake dam, headstock, a number of times per year. And uh, this is actually shot in October where we're uh, working on the two spillway gates because we want them to be reliable because they move up and down a lot during flood risk management operations like right now. So uh, that's important. And also for public safety because given, given the, the amount of public use along the river system. So to that, uh, we have a, a number of water use interests. So salmon, um, we work with DFO. Uh, we have actually 17 fish migration and spawning flows over the year, certain times, and uh, that allows them to move upstream. We also at times provide flows in the out migration and in late May to allow those uh, smolts, uh, Chinook, to move past the uh, seals in the estuary and provide other flows where we can to assist salmon. We also have minimum fish habitat flows where we try to maintain fish habitat for, for salmon as well. And of course, you're familiar with this, uh, this aspect in terms of domestic water supply. So we work closely with the, uh, the staff here on, on domestic water supply in terms of how much water storage we have, if there's potentially uh, turbidity events uh, especially within the river. Um, and so, of course, we have a water use agreement with the regional districts so we can withdraw water for, for the valley in terms of domestic water supply. So the next is kind of recreation. It's a beautiful watershed and um, you can get about 500 people on that river at any given time in the summertime. And this is Barber's Hole, uh, just downstream of the Puntledge Diversion Dam. 
This is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this area. Uh, Nim Falls, very, very busy this summer. These pictures were taken this summer. Um, and this is just, uh, just downstream of Nim Falls there. So the point here is there's a lot of people in the river. Um, and so we want to make sure that the water flows are constant. And if there is some kind of unplanned flow event that we can have sirens in place and so forth to warn the public. And of course, we have a lot of tubers. We can get about 2,000 tubers per, um, uh, per day actually going into the river system. So it's a lot, lot of use and a lot of activity. Then we get in the fall and we just had the chum fishery uh, October 1st through November 15th. It's very busy, a lot of people on the river system. And then of course, we have our kayakers. Um, they take advantage of flows, which the, right now they're on the, they've been on the river the last few days. Um, and so there's a lot of recreation interests uh, along the river system that uh, we have to be aware of and think about. So in terms of the water supply, of course, this was just taken from ours and Ron. I took this a uh, number of weeks ago in terms of uh, water abundance and looking at inflows that come into into the watershed. So within that, we have pretty extreme variances in terms of uh, drought conditions to flood risk management. So you can see here the picture on the left, how flows are quite low, and the pictures on the right where there's there's too much water. So we're trying to balance those issues. It'd be nice to have a normal year <laughs> where everything's just normal, but uh, we don't see that too often. So for uh, this, this is just kind of a, a graph that shows the monthly amounts on the bottom, the 12 months of the year, and our water supply forecast or water supply year goes from September to October, or October to uh, September, pardon me. So uh, October, November to date actually has been a bit drier than normal. And uh, the top graph just shows the average red line in terms of how much water comes in, and which you can see we're actually almost about 50% of normal for uh, October, November, although is changing a bit the last few days. This is a, a graph that shows uh, the amount of inflows from October to September, same period. Red line is average, the blue line is this year, and the green line is what we're forecasting over the last next few days. And then you can see all the other gray lines. That's all the history of water and flows and storms since the 1960s. And so we've had some large storm events. But so far, the storms have been uh, not too bad. This, this graph here, I know it's very busy. The top uh, mount, basically the dotted line, is the Comoxite Reservoir. So you can see um, you know, the blue line, uh, usually typically where it is, the red line. Um, and so you know, this year was not too bad. We had a, a fairly dry uh, spring. We've actually had five consecutive dry springs, which is not sure what that's about in terms of trends but that creates a bit of a challenge for us. Um, and then we want to have the reservoir full for end of June for water supply, fish habitat, all those kinds of things, and then get into this time of year. So pretty simple. Uh, the bottom part is the actual, a uh, lot of the river flows and discharges, and uh, we'll get too much into that, but uh, um, not, this year was not too bad, all things considered. Still another, another month of it to go. So within all that water supply and coming in, um, we have flood risk management. And so um, that considers how much water is coming into the system, what the downstream river flows are doing, like the grounds and the solum, what the high tide is, if it's low tide, medium, king tide, which we're having right now, uh, to um, you know, storm surge. So, we've, so we basically had a scenario today, oddly enough, where we had a King Ocean tide. We had some storm surge from winds coming out of southeast. But uh, in this case, the reservoir was in a good, good position, so we really held back a lot of water. Um, the Browns and Sloan didn't react much. And so while it was pretty full this morning, uh, there was no really no isolated flooding. I understand Lewis Park gets some water in it, which is normal. But uh, the river flows are actually coming up now, um, and we're also reducing again for the lower high tide um, at 6 o'clock. So we're in this pattern of going up and down. So that's kind of benefit. So it's a matter of how all these things align and what BC Hydro can do in terms of uh, holding back water key times. So of course we work with you and emergency responders and, and all that as we go through events like, like that. 
So this is uh, this is just a graph uh, of an example of December 2014, where we had inflows into the system from Ox Lake around 900 cubic meters per second. And then down below is the discharges from the Comox Dam. Well, it goes kind of up and down um, with tides and so forth. And we were releasing no more than 300 cubic meters per second. And a lot of that is just the configuration of the dam and spillway gates. Um, we can only release so much water anyway. But we do attenuate a lot of the flows that come downstream. Uh, this one here is what's the uh, actual flow down within the Courtney estuary. And so you can see here uh, the flow is around total around six, almost you know 700 cubic meters per second of that. Um, we have the red line, which is the Solom River. Uh, we have the green line, which is the Browns River, um, and then the, the dark, which is our flows going in and out. So the point is, is we're trying to hold back water as key times, um, but there's only so much that we can do, and potentially isolated flooding downstream can happen regardless of what BC Hydro is doing if things align in the wrong way. But this is a good snapshot of, of what we do in terms of holding wet back water for four hours or more in advance of high tides and then slowly ramping up. Um, and so ideally we can release high flows and the storm's over. So this is what it looked like in, uh, in 2014 um, in terms down below and some of the impacts downstream with all that water coming downstream. This is another example uh, from 2010 uh, where we had a storm uh, what we really get nervous about is atmospheric rivers. Um, that's uh, a lot of snow melt and heavy rain. And we're going to get real big spikes and very high inflows, which is the red line. Versus a large storm, which down below the rain intensity could be very similar, but a lot of it is falling as snow on the upper watershed. So the blue line signifies that, that you don't get too much of, a, of an inflow. So I put these uh, on, you know, we hold water back and that's great, but the bathtub gets full. So um, we have an example here of each of those, you know, 2010 and 2014. So the January event, uh, the reservoir in purple was just reached about two, six, uh, 136.2 meters. And once we get to 136.5 meters, we cannot hold water back during high tides. It's just basically whatever's coming in goes out. And we've never been in that position and hopefully we don't. But it's it's going to be a matter of time. But that's that's a consideration. And then the blue uh, spike uh, in December shows an exact example of that different time of year. Then um, for a warning system in touch with the public, we we really uh, updated that. It's up to Canadian Dam Association guidelines. We have numerous uh, sirens from Comox Dam to accomplish part to warn the public of of uh, unplanned flow events when they do take place. They're rare, but they do happen, so we need to advise the public of that. In addition to that, we have uh, an upcoming project, a flow control project. So while we can alert public of unplanned flow events, we want to not have any unplanned flow events. So uh, we've got a project in place to um, starting potentially in 2023 to uh, make some capital expenditures um, on the system. And so uh, basically it's in two components. One is the spillway. Um, the two spillway gates, the hoist system, gate controls. Uh, we want to make improvements there. And then downstream from the diversion down to the powerhouse, uh, a number of improvements uh, with communications and um, with efficient take and some of those things in terms of the, the fish screens that we have there. So those kind of improvements will, uh, you know, kind of really limit the amount of unplanned flow events that can take place or mechanical issues, equipment issues. So this project's in the tens of millions of dollars and we'll provide the board with more information as it's developed. We also have the Penstock Recoding Project as you may be familiar with, uh, that's been going on for some time, basically taking off the old material. Uh, there's like three components, putting in new epoxies and new, new paint to protect it from corrosion. So uh, that work continues to be well into next year as we move into that. And we'll also be uh, working on the inside of the Penstock Recoding Project, but we've delayed that till next summer. So when the regional districts finish their projects, um, there won't be any stage three water restrictions or like that. So we've held off to that. Um, so this is, we don't have a, we don't want any public in and around that area. Of course, the regional districts got their works as well along here, the water main, but uh, so far generally the, the general public's been pretty good at staying away. Uh, given it is a construction zone. Uh, here's an example of the old penstock on the left and the new one on the right with a new fresh coat of paint. 
hopefully you don't see any more graffiti. The old one's been tagged quite a bit, so I keep an eye on that. Looks looks nice right now. And then lastly, I'd like to conclude that um, you know I've worked with staff and different folks within the regional district for over 20 years now, almost 21 years, and we have a good relationship in terms of uh, coordinating things of mutual interest, but it was really put to the test <laughs> with this one, um, with the regional district uh, utilizing um, our Penstock corridor for, for part of the water main. So, and it was Charlie Gore and Chris LaRose and others, Russell, and, um, you know, we've, I think we've done as well as possible to manage to do that. So I think so far it's uh, so good on that front in terms of us being able to do our work and our operations in the regional district doing, doing your work, so. Appreciate that, and that concludes it. So, thank you. Great. Are you open to questions? Absolutely. All right, Director Arbor. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was the, the first time I, I saw your presentation. I really liked it from two years ago. But, um, and thanks so much for your collaboration with the RD. I think uh, through the Water Committee, I've heard good things, including how you know you helped us along the way with the project and going through the Bevan. Uh, lands as well and things like that and under the high, highway so very much appreciated. I just have a general question uh, you know I know your grid tied and everything else but just the basic information of how many homes would uh, you know in a normal year would you power uh, through the, uh, the, the station? Power? Yeah well basically it runs at uh, 24 megawatts of full capacity so that's enough for about 12,000 homes but that's when it's running at full capacity so um, Oftentimes in the spring, uh, late summer, early fall, it's running at third of capacity and sometimes even shut down. Of course, we do shut it down for maintenance for a month or two of the year when we're combined. So it's just part of the uh, grid system uh, that we provide and it's nice to have local power. Uh, certainly not enough to power the valley, um, but uh, it's a key component. Um, so yeah. You know, thank, thank you. I mean, we're at, I know this board is interested in energy self-sufficiency and I think you're a great asset to the Valley. And I, I thank you for managing through all these different interests as well. Um, that's to the benefit of the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Director Frisch online, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jaren. And thank uh, Stephen for the report. Um, it is Stephen, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's all good, Dave. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I knew it sounded like you, and <clears throat> it probably says it in the agenda, but um, I had a question about historical flows, and it seems like you have a ton of data on it. Have you broken it down into sort of decade by decade to see if there's any pattern emerging? I know, you know, when you look at the climate change statistics, it shows significant changes. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you're seeing that too, and perhaps expecting less uh, water in the future based on what you're seeing in the past. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, we have a lot of information. Um, I, I would suggest that after about, uh, about 2000, we've, we've seen some significant changes or more wide variations. And one of the analogies I've heard of climate change, which is kind of a good one, is you have your natural variation of La Nina, El Nino, Earth oscillation or tilt and all kinds of natural things that happen. Uh, climate change just adds the bookends a little wider. So right. what that means is that you get a um, little more of an extreme. And so uh, when we, uh, you, we hadn't had a flood event in, in, in a court in the estuary since 1994. And then we had two flood events within a few months of each other in the fall of 2009 and in January 2010. And then we had a couple other events like 2014 and, and, and 15. Um, and so a lot of people were wondering just to that question, like what's going on? Why, why you know, we seem to be setting one in 50 year river flow totals every couple of months here. So um, there was actually a study done um, through uh, Timberwest at the time and, and the regional district and Northwest Hydraulics and, and others. And they found that storm intensities have gone up 40%. And so um, that's, um, that's a concern um, in terms of the wide swings. So I, you know, I, I've been around on the island for quite a while. I remember the winters being quite misty and a little bit rainy, but now we seem to go a couple of weeks with not much and then a big, huge rain event and it was dry again for a while. So 
we do have climate change considerations. We work with UVEC and others. Um, obviously, BC Hydro is majority of water in terms of hydroelectric power. So the, we have a keen interest in snowpack and when that water is coming into the system. So here locally, uh, basically what we're looking at is a um, little warmer, uh, little warmer temperatures. Uh, and it looks like we can get a little more water um, in, in the winter time versus the summertime, but overall the water coming in is about the same. It's just uh, not maybe at the time when we need it. So for BC Hydro, we learn every year. Every year we provide, provide a different set of parameters in terms of inflows coming in and we adjust our operations. We're, we're very conservative for obvious reasons. You know, we want to have water for um, domestic water supply, fish, uh, flood risk management, uh, dam safety, all those kind of things. We're, we have a great team behind uh, to try to do that, but it, it is challenging that, that there are changes happening and, and how we adapt and modify to that. So uh, basically it'd be less snowpack. We're going to a place where there's, there's less snowpack over time. Um, so yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, I really appreciate all the considerations you have to take into account. And um, uh, it sounds like right now you're saying about the same water, but much harder to deal with uh, because of the extreme events. So thanks, thanks for sharing that and good, good luck with it. Um, I'm a little higher up, but I know lots of us and Courtney are, are keen to see you doing a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation and your stewardship of, uh, of all of these complexities over these many years. The one thing you didn't mention, uh, and this is something that I benefit from along with use of the river, is the trail system that Hydro maintains. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, well, we have uh, um, uh, basically it's a public use management area that we have from the Comox Dam down to Pumlish Diversion Dam. And uh, BC Hydro took over that over as I mentioned earlier in the 1950s. And uh, so I'd say about the 1990s, there was significant funds from Forestry Renewal BC at the time, uh, also some from Hydro and other groups. And um, there's a significant amount of trails developed on the other side of the river. Some trails were built without our knowledge, but we all, you know, that happens. Um, and so, yeah, we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of use of those trails. Obviously, they connect uh, downstream to the Nymph Falls, and uh, some people walk along the uh, Pensac Corridor and along that way too. Not hugely keen about that because it's operationally an area, but you know, it is what it is, and that's okay. So yeah, we uh, we have a contractor that maintains the trails and uh, we spend funds to do that. So um, yeah, thanks very much. It's uh, worth highlighting. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any further questions. I just wanted to say thanks for uh, presenting today and giving us some insight into the considerations and challenges that you guys face with water management. And with that, uh, is there any opposed to receipt? No. Oh, all right. And that's carried. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Next, we have Strathcona Regional District Connected Coast Project. David Leach. Thank you. Welcome, Dave. Hi, thank you. Um, so I just come today to talk about um, connectivity and uh, and internet broadband. So for the, those of you that may not be aware, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background into the Connect Innovate project. Uh, 2018, the federal government in partnership with Indigenous Services and the province uh, created a rural remote uh, connectivity program to service rural and remote communities with uh, internet broadband to service um, communities with 5010 download speeds. So the CRTC came up with a um, a benchmark that all homes in Canada, all communities should be serviced with minimum 5010 uh, internet connectivity. And to do that, um, the, the, the government had to yeah, resource the program because uh, the big telecos um, were just not pushing their way into rural remote communities. So the regional district in 2018 made an application we've had uh, in Strathcona, a um, strategic plan to um, resource connectivity in, in our region and our rural communities for some time. And um, as a result of this, um, we ended up in a partnership with uh, 
City West Teleco, who is a subsidiary company of Prince Rupert. They're a teleco that's been around for 100 years. And we made um, an application jointly. And what you kind of see here is um, almost 4,000 kilometers of subsea fiber cable that connects to the Vancouver Internet Exchange, wraps its way uh, around Vancouver Island and up the West Coast. Let's see if this. Uh... Oops. Uh, yeah, so uh, the program provides uh, landing sites for 154 plus or minus communities, um, 50, I'd say 50 some because the, the number changes a little bit here and there, uh, Indigenous uh, communities and uh, 44 First Nations crosses about 13 regional districts. Um, so awarded the program in 2018 took a long time to get contribution agreements with the partners finalized, but we've done that. The regional district, again, has a joint venture with City West to own, operate, and build uh, the service. Uh, again, about 3,400 kilometers of subsea cable and uh, funding provided by the, the federal, provincial, and indigenous services. So again, uh, a joint venture, one of the important parts about a joint venture uh, with the teleco is um, we're local government, we're not experts in telecommunications and they are, and they're not really experts in local government. So combining resources, um, we, we have taken the project on as one, uh, a lot of mutual benefit that I just mentioned, but another one being in connectivity uh, industry, there are many, many industries uh, across the world nowadays that just won't operate without full redundancy of their service. They're so dependent on internet connectivity that without redundancy, they won't locate to your communities, operate businesses. So City West, uh, just show a little map here of uh, what their terrestrial uh, line is and then connected coast wraps around Vancouver Island. So it offers full redundancy uh, within the project in all communities on the island in the West Coast. City West, again, been a teleco that's um, been around for 100 years, owned by the city of Prince Rupert, about 15,000 teleco customers and uh, about 85 employees. So how this relates to um, the CBRD in your region. So starting the spring of 2021, we will begin laying subsea fiber cable from the Vancouver Internet Exchange across to Nanaimo and um, up the coast. Uh, it's hard for me to see on here, but um, zoom in a little bit closer. Um, we are landing in the CBRD at Bowser, splitting between Denman and Hornby, connecting at Comox and then Williams Beach. We have uh, landing sites there. Uh, just to get some perspective on kind of what we're doing, um, you know, it's subsea cable deployed by ship. Um, we come up on, uh, you know, beach landings, a uh, little, uh, diagram of the fiber cable there and um, you know a fairly unsubstantial uh, cable box landing and then into the community. So uh, the project is uh, phased uh, in three phases that uh, starts in uh, June 2021 um, and again that goes from Vancouver all the way up to Prince Rupert and then from Prince Rupert up around Cape Scott down Zabalas Tassis area and then in 2023 concludes with the, the full wrap around Vancouver Island. I wanted to touch base on this because I think there's gonna be many questions. The landing sites for Connected Coast Project were determined by uh, the federal government and the CRTC. Uh, again, we have a benchmark of what's called a 50-10. So it's 50 download speed, 10 upload speed that uh, every community of two homes or more is entitled to. So uh, I'm sure everyone has seen a lot of funding opportunities out there for last mile projects. And those funding opportunities are, are limited by what the CRTC establishes as served and underserved communities. So I've tried to take a little uh, snapshot of the CBRD areas and anything in green um, is considered underserved and eligible for funding. There's probably about two to $3 billion of uh, federal and provincial money available out there. And um, if it's within a green dot, it's eligible for funding. And if it's not, uh, it's not eligible. What's important, you might think, if you can see closely on the map is 
there are a lot of areas, including, you know, within the CBRD and, and all the other regional districts that you have served and underserved, but within your served areas, um, you're going to have a lot of spots that are um, quite limited. So, uh, you know, I thought there may be a question, let's say Comox, why is Comox a landing site on this if it's just serving underserved communities? But one thing um, that the CRTC recognizes is as important as serving the, the rural remote communities is, is it redundancy within the network? The big telecos require full redundancy in there. And these are opportunities that the CRTC has identified for landing sites that telecos um, can connect in and have redundancy within their networks. So that's Comox. Having said that, there's still plenty of areas within Comox and, and even Courtney that um, you know, don't really have a true 5010 service. So thought there might be of interest in it because after the, the backbone connected coast, it's all about the last mile and how we serve our communities. So just a little snapshot of what the CBRD looks like. Um, what we're doing now, uh, I'm sure everyone can appreciate when you look at the, the west coast of uh, BC and Vancouver Island, having 155 landing spots, we're engaged in permitting with the front counter BC and, uh, and again, we can all appreciate the, um, the permitting, the environmental, the land acquisition, the 10 year agreements, so on and so forth, that it's going to engage with uh, all these landing sites. It, it's really a permitting nightmare. And so uh, our Connected Coast team is working with in this regional district because there's landings in Comox and the CBRD staff to look at the uh, best landing spots, development sites, locations, things that would make practical sense and um, are, are doable in terms of getting land agreements. So what we see in the, the map, we have nothing concrete finalized as for these are the exact spots and we're, we're working with staff. So in order to, um, to further these applications, Front Counter BC requires us to have community support um, for these applications, saying that the, the community supports in you know, all these works and, and permitting and, and tenure agreements. So I have a, a recommendation here that uh, I would hope that the uh, CBRT can support and um, free to answer any questions. Great, yes, Director Arbor. Thank you. Thanks, nice to see you a couple of years later. We had a good mm -hmm. internet meeting a couple of years ago. Um, and I really wanna commend uh, yourself and Strathcona Regional District for what is really transformational work that you're doing with this project. Um, I mean, the, the connectivity you're gonna build, especially in First Nation communities um, uh, along the entire coast, coming out of a regional district is just amazing and uh, really kudos for taking the lead on that. Um, I think the board knows I've been pretty hard on the TELUS and Shaw delegations that came to this board and uh, in, uh, in those cases I, I definitely voice uh, my lack of support for anything they do until they actually support um, last mile <laughs> infrastructure in rural communities. This project is very exciting. Um, I think, you know, in, and, and I have no problem supporting it, but I, I would ask if, if uh, that support also um, included a, a, an exploration with our staff around uh, the potential. I mean, yeah, Hornby and Denman were coming up, as we all know, as big green blobs. And so I, I would love for our staff, maybe as part of that support, to explore um, what landing sites or collaboration with the Connected Coast project could look like. And then I would expect to see a staff report. I know time is pressing. I think we have some awareness that this board supported the, um, the work of Hornby and Denman and the regional district sponsored um, um, applications and, and work that's been completing around digital roadmaps. So if you have, uh, my question would be, would you be amenable to that if we tacked that along with the rest of the general support? So I have good news for you. Um, our meeting a couple of years ago did not go to waste. Um, we uh, we have identified that Hornby and Denman, I think they're really anomalies in the CRTC funding and the mapping of the landing sites. So we have proactively made landing applications in anticipation of working with the CBRD and getting landings on Denman and Hornby. So in our front counter applications, we are 
without your approval, we will, we went ahead and made those applications in anticipation of that. So I have been talking with staff and uh, I think we're leading up to something in the near future of me likely coming back and presenting an opportunity for them in Hornby. Um, what I can say is uh, BC Ferries at all their locations. So there's many uh, advantages uh, to communities that are served as well. So it's just not a rural remote play in that um, we're servicing Coast Guard locations, radio locations, lighthouses. We are engaged with uh, uh, NRCAN and early warning systems for earthquakes and tsunamis. So there's really a lot of advantage to all communities even that are served. But um, uh, BC Ferries has approached us at wanting redundant connectivity at all their uh, terminals. Um, conveniently, we have identified two locations, one on Hornby and, and one on Denman. And so those are the sites we're looking at. And uh, I'm working on something uh, with staff to bring forward on a, a recommendation for a couple landings uh, on Denman and Hornby. Okay. And, and thank you for that. And, and just checking back through this chair to our staff, I guess we would have capacity to investigate this a little further. Yeah. Thank you. We'll take yeah. that as a yes. So thank you so much for your efforts. And again, um, really great work. I, I congratulated Michelle Babchuk too uh, when she, when you guys signed the final agreements. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I know you're well supported by the province and the federal government. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any further questions. Yeah. I wanted to thank you for presenting today. It actually was... Um, very informative for myself because uh, I, I wasn't previously aware of this project and and uh, Strathcona's involvement. So thanks very much for that. You're welcome. Um, as to your request, it's probably the same as um, Strathcona Regional District. We don't um, uh, consider uh, the requests at the meeting that they are presented, but at the following meeting. So that will be the same with this request. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Sure. You're welcome. And anyone opposed to receipt? And that's carried. Okay, so we're on to Food Hub grant opportunity with John Watson. Thank you. Welcome, John. Thanks very much. Um, quick presentation to give you an update on a recent uh, application opportunity from the Ministry of Agriculture in regards to Food Hub submission. Um, pleased to also have uh, Mr. Craig Freeman uh, with us from the Murville Community Association. Uh, hopefully I get it right, Craig, uh, VP and Treasurer. So that's, uh, Craig's going to jump up and say a few words after on behalf of the association. And uh, in case I forget, um, and I, I, I don't want to forget, so I'll tell you now, uh, what an incredible group of individuals and uh, really uh, our thanks goes out to Craig and his team for putting together the, uh, a lot of the work behind the proposals. So starting off, um, provide a bit of a background um, to bring everybody up to speed as to where uh, we are today. Um, we, uh, which way do I go? Sorry, folks, first time here. There we go. So a bit of a timeline. Um, the first Comox Valley uh, Food Hub submission went in uh, in June of 2019. Um, it was a provincial call for proposals. Um, there were, uh, I think, nine finalists uh, from that call. The Comox Valley was one. Uh, we didn't succeed in that, but the success uh, of that effort, I think, was um, Quite, um, quite significant in the context of the multi-partners involved and the approach taken. Uh, more recently, I think the RD uh, approved uh, support and for a second submission, somewhat modified, to uh, the Rural Economic Recovery Program, SIRUP is the acronym. And in this case, um, this was where the Merville Hall was identified for hall upgrades. Um, needed uh, in general for the hall, as well as to include uh, Food Hub in the form of a commercial kitchen and processing activity. Um, that applica application has gone in 
and it will be reviewed at the time that it will be reviewed. We expect uh, some time in the new year to hear back on that proposal. And I'll speak a little bit more to, to that uh, a little bit later. And then the current Ministry of Agriculture uh, project timeline, uh, they released uh, information uh, to us about two weeks ago. And uh, with support from CBRD staff and uh, some discussions, uh, it is a potential opportunity for the community to apply for the commercial kitchen portion under that particular economic recovery funding. This is uh, separate from the community infrastructure program and it is dedicated funding through the Ministry of Agriculture that was announced earlier this uh, fall in the context of food security and economic recovery. Um, the dates there are the expected start date as you can see, it's a week and a half or two from now um, in the case of a successful award and substantial progress on the application or on the project would need to be in place and demonstrated by March 31st. Ownership of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the kitchen and the upgrades obviously will rest with the Murrayville Hall Association. Current project components, these are pulled from the syrup application and remain the same um, with some minor modifications um, that we'll need to do to fit the Ministry of Agriculture um, application. And uh, let you read through them. I think uh, some, of the, some of the really interesting components of this are the opportunity for some outdoor um, sorting and processing space uh, in, inside cold storage um, and, uh, and dry storage. And of course, um, proper venting, uh, gas upgrade and uh, new electrical service for the hall. Oh, that's why, there we go. So a bit about the opportunity, this is, um, identified through various surveys and community engagement activities that have occurred over the last couple of years in the context of um, the Innovate 2030 process and other processes. Um, one of the more significant um, requirements in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, requirements is the, is the requirement to um, show uh, significant process in this fiscal. Uh, provincial fiscal ending March 31st, which in this case is um, at the moment, it looks like we're capable of, of doing. Um, and the other important change would be the last bullet on the slide, which reflects the fact that uh, eligibility uh, requires a confirmed local government partnership. And uh, in this case, uh, that was provided as well for the SARP application. Um, another key component in this particular food health application is the requirement for food safety. Um, training um, has up uh, um, and adhering to the safe food for Canadians regulations. Um, these, these are, are really important uh, now in general uh, when we're talking about these types of activities uh, on a community basis. And uh, certainly when we're thinking about different food sources or types um, produce and meat, for example, uh, these different streams have to have individual plans and, and there needs to be a really clear um, requirement for food safety within the facility. I've noted a bit of public consultation. I've mentioned it briefly here. Um, I think that uh, there are many opportunities to look at uh, the agriculture sector and and there are significant projects that that I think still need to be addressed uh, this particular opportunity is a very short one and uh, and the timelines of course are are very tight given that it's uh, tomorrow so providing this opportunity into this stream was considered a, a, a good step forward project costs um, are pulled from the last application um, we will have to make adjustments to this, but I wanted to break down uh, some of the broad costs. You can see on the slide, um, there's design and food safety planning budgets, uh, professional fees, 
uh, to deal with uh, permitting and geotech and other items required. Construction material cost, of which about 314,000 is specific to commercial kitchen costs. Um, venting and hood requirements are, of course, uh, fairly significant. Um, these facilities under a Ministry of Agriculture food hub uh, requirement are meant to facilitate online booking systems, um, sharing of information, training. Um, they require a, 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 a quite a significant facilitation at the facility. Craig's going to mention a little bit about that when he speaks. Um, and then they require as well a contingency fee for that for the project and their guideline for that was based on class D estimates. Um, we're probably closer to class C estimates um, based on the quotes that Craig and his team and, and myself have been able to secure on the project. Um, again, uh, noting the last bullet with the HACCP, um, these, uh, these are critical components uh, in the event that we wish to submit for over 500,000. Uh, in all of the economic recovery grants that we are seeing and supporting um, from our department, and uh, the notion of uh, restarting the economy or um, supporting businesses in need and, and certainly job creation are, are first and foremost on, um, on everybody's minds. Um, there's a number of um, really well identified need in this community for enhanced and increased um, access to food safe uh, facilities, aggregation, sorting. Um, and, and I think this is something that we need to consider regardless of whether this particular grant um, is successful. Uh, noted a recommendation uh, based on the, the uh, information from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, the, it's the local governments here, the regional district would need to approve um, to submit and uh, to manage the funding, um, likely be in a management uh, agreement with, uh, with the Murrayville Hall Association. And with that, I think I'll bring Craig up for a couple comments around the work you've been doing in the vision. Thanks, Craig. Um, uh, can you hear me? Because it's kind of hard to hear over there. Um, so I guess we were approached by Edwin Grieve, Area C rep. Myrtle Hall is in Area C and uh, John Watson. They suggested uh, the Myrtle Hall could benefit from being a food hub. Uh, here in the, in the Comox Valley. Merville itself, or the Merville Hall itself, is the epicenter of the farming community in that area. And the thinking is that with a, a food hub in that location, it would enable the farmers to easily get to the hub. And then from there, food distribution can be taken by truck rather than going, having a farmer travel all the way into the town to a hub and then traveling back to his farm it's easier to have the distribution uh, set up once the processing is done. And uh, the Myrtle Hall itself is um, it's a three acre site. Uh, there's a lot of renovations and things happening there. There's two uh, heritage buildings that are now on the site that are church is completed. The other one, which is a church hall is just nearing completion. So a lot of, uh, a lot of work and um, money and effort has gone into turning this site into a bit of a uh, tourist attraction and po possibly uh, an agri-tourism agri uh, site as well. Um, there, is, uh, there are several um, events that happen at the hall. You might be familiar with the Garlic Fest, very successful. There's the Heritage Fall Fair in the fall and Christmas markets. Uh, there's also a summer gumboot market that's attracting up to 50 um, vendors now. It's getting quite successful. So there is a, an outlet for many um, small-time vendors and produce uh, suppliers to come to this market and service um, the local community. Uh, the site being between Campbell River and Courtney, is pretty well the center there, and it's a, it's on a tourism route, which is that the highway that links the two. Um, there is 
plan for a, a caretaker site or a caretaker dwelling to be built on site. That way the the uh, hall could be taken care of and all the grounds could be taken care of by somebody there rather than having uh, staff or whatever coming in and out, in and out. So this would be a person who would be hired to manage that site and thus be able to uh, coordinate comings and goings of vehicles and, uh, and farmers. Um, there's a community garden in the field area, which is a two acre area. This community garden started uh, last year with the fencing. This year, um, three plots out of the potential of about 10 have been uh, used and a lot of produce has come off these sites. The people doing the planting and the harvesting are quite surprised. In fact, Lush Valley this year was a recipient of uh, quite a lot of produce. and. Uh, it looks good for next year. There's more people lining up to grab a site or to grab a plot. So this is part of the um, community education incubator garden plan that the Myrtle Hall has for encouraging people to plant, you know, off, off um, or out of their uh, living space. Um, don't know what else I could say here apart from um, the hall would be uh, delighted to get involved with something like this because um, from a planning session we conducted in 2018, uh, we found that that's what people were looking for. They wanted a vibrant center there and they were very interested in the agritourism uh, aspect of it. And this area where the Myrtle Hall is located now is uh, close well, just across the street almost is the Mars uh, Aviation Rescue Center, uh, the Mountain Aviation Rescue Center. There's a new fire hall that is going to be built uh, just down the road from there. There's a Merville store. So this is becoming a bit of a hub, a bit of a center for Merville community anyhow. And uh, having this hub there, uh, food hub, would definitely add to um, this vibrancy, and it might also be a way to slow down the traffic because we're looking at trying to uh, minimize the speed that's of traffic passing through there. And so this would be great to have it slow down so it's safer. There's already been two deaths in that area. Have it safer and people can come by and come to the hall and smell roses. I think that's about, that's about it for me. Great, thanks so much, Greg. Okay. You might get questions, so. Okay, thanks to you both. And yes, we do have a question, Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, actually, I do have a question for Craig. So if you don't mind coming back to the, to the, uh, the podium. Um, I wasn't aware that the uh, Ministry of Agriculture required, um, you know, a food hub to, to go to HACCP um, certification. So, that's it's good to note. Um, I've only ever been in one other HACCP certified facility, and that's Eat More Sprouts. Um, and for them to even allow me to come inside required all kinds of safety protocols. And I'm wondering if the Hall Association, um, maybe I should ask what percentage of the yellow hall will make up the food hub? Is it the entire hall or you know, where, where are all of these different components going to live? Um, thanks, Sarzina. From my understanding, it would be uh, from the kitchen back, uh, a certain portion of that, plus underneath the kitchen uh, backstage area. The rest of the hall would remain as community hall. So okay. uh, the idea is not to turn that community hall into something else. Uh, there's rental spaces below the, um, the area where pickleball was being played at the moment. There's it because it's a full eight foot basement. So all of that would remain in the community and uh, from the kitchen on would become the designated food um, processing area. Okay. So understanding that and then the need for the HACCP certification, um, I would be quite surprised if the ministry would be, you know, and knowing what I know about the users of, of the hall, 
you know, our Mid Island Farmers Institute, weddings, and other festivals who use the kitchen area. I have a hard time understanding how that's going to still be possible in a HACCP certified kitchen to have just the regular public who aren't HACCP trained to be able to use that facility. So if that's the case, that's fine. But I'm just wanting to know if the Hall Association understands that and that potentially it won't be as, um, I guess, not lucrative, but um, as a spot for those types of, of rentals if the kitchen is no longer you know, available for events like that. Is that something that the Hall Association considered? Well, okay. yeah, yeah. Just to interject, so the Ministry of Agriculture funding is has up, um, being able to demonstrate HACCP adherence in, uh, in your plans uh, in the event you wish to apply in excess of the $500,000. Okay. It'll still be required uh, to have appropriate safety yeah. um, plans and whatnot, uh, but the HACCP requirement is um, is in the event of an application in excess of 500000 Which we are, right? Uh, at the moment, if we just uh, deal with the commercial kitchen component, we would not exceed the 500000 Oh, apologies. I thought I saw a number around 900 something. Yeah, that was uh, the original application that went in and it included additional components that the Hall Association wanted to see in the in the different street, so. So um, through the chair, if, if I could, a subsequent, could, could you clarify what, how much we're actually applying for then? The commercial kitchen components will be the focus of the application and it should, likely not exceed the 500,000. Okay, so the, because I saw um, gas upgrade, the excavation and foundation, none of that's going to be included in the? No, that would be uh, elements from the original application for which we're building this one from. Okay, okay. And so um, the Hall Association is aware that this is just for the kitchen upgrade, so not the the caretaker building, which I saw earlier on, that doesn't sound like it would be covered in this in this application. Yeah, that's the other application. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the different stream. Okay. Yeah. And so, sorry. Just there's started. there's no other questions. Right? Okay. Just to clarify, the the funding, the application that went into the other stream, that one's still a live application, or has it been now moved over? Live live application still. Okay. Yeah. So there's two, we, we have now, this is a second one on top. Should you wish to proceed, yes. Okay. Will, will it look like we're double dipping? We have spoken to the ministry and have had some staff discussions in regards to the opportunity to submit for the food hub and we've been recommended to submit Ministry of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, they're aware of the other application and have reviewed it. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. And Director Arbor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just not quite a question. I think I just want to comment this. Uh, I'm glad to see that forward. Obviously, food security has been discussed uh, through and through. And it's nice to see that the Merville Community Association see themselves playing a role in that. And, and I agree with the central location. Um, so for myself, I'd have no problem providing uh, the support requested tonight. Um, even though my only question maybe to chair and staff is, I guess we'd have to make a, a, an exception to late requests uh, in order to uh, consider that. It sounds like the deadline is tomorrow. Is that correct? Uh, so that'd be my only question, whether we, could, we, would be, um, we would have to vote on that or what does it look like tonight in order to provide that timely request? Um, Madam Chair, just maybe to uh, comment on that. I was looking at the minister's letter to, to Mr. Watson and yes, they are very um, encouraging to get your application in by November 18th, but they do give a little bit of wiggle room. They say, we recognize this, the time constraints, you may not have a complete project. So my suggestion would be that, um, you know, the, the, the board gives some indication as to whether they're supportive with this application tonight, but they would confirm any resolutions required at their meeting within one week's time. Yes. <clears throat> that sounds appropriate. Director Morin. Great. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted about clarification. Um, the first 
the grant, the application that went in for the 20th was the rural economic recovery. And then this, this next one is what's the name of that one and how do they connect or not connect? Cause you, I think you mentioned something about a continuation or I just wanted clarity on that. So this is um, the first application was part of the provincial government's economic recovery response. And it was announced in September. The ministry of, it was a general call for applications on October 1st um, with deadline of October 29th. And uh, there were four separate streams that communities and individuals could contribute to. So we are quite thankful that we were able to work together with everybody to submit under that. Ministry of Agriculture has um, dedicated funding for economic recovery for food hubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the first next step that they're taking um, in regards to uh, reaching out to the proponents that applied in the original round before the pandemic to see if there's an opportunity to move parts or all of uh, previous applications forward. Right. Okay. Um, because the first one was more kitchen upgrade, not a food hub per se. Is that correct? And what was the amount of that one again? I'm trying to remember. The total application that went in was 900 and I think I said that. Oh, for that oh, one. Yeah, about 948,000. Okay. Um, because I guess I am concerned about the late, uh, I mean, I, I understand that there's some flexibility with the date, but, um, and I think it's wonderful that, uh, that uh, you know, Merville has stepped up and I love all your ideas. They sound amazing. But I guess I'm thinking about um, for a regional food hub, it, it seems like there was one enthusiastic partner that kind of came to light and was amazing. And I think if it was under a specific rural economic recovery um, piece, then that sounds like it fits. But I guess if we're looking at a food hub um, more regionally, it seems like there hasn't been that much consultation. I think that was um, recently in, in terms of this, this late hour proposal. So I guess that's what I'm struggling with a little bit. Because um, I think there's lots of folks interested in a food hub um, and have ideas around that. So yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, just to let you know that um, Director Grieve is, is not on the line right now, so he's not able to um, contribute to the conversation. Director Hamir. Um, thank you. So just in line with uh, Director Arbor's comments and our CAOs, um, if we do decide to go ahead with, um, with approval, either at this meeting or next meeting, I wonder if we can just, um, I would ask actually if we could delay it till next meeting, because I would like to know what the actual ask is. Um, I'm, I'm kind of unclear because I saw quite a large contingency with the first one and I don't know what, you know, the final number that we're asking for here is and what contingency that, that our staff um, would require. So um, is, is that something that staff would be able to work with CVETS on is, is coming up with the final number in the final budget? John, can you clarify what the final number is? At for this because you've, you've prepared a lot of the application that is required or has been provided to you by the ministry, correct? Maybe if you can just uh, identify those components and yeah. certainly staff will be here to work with uh, with Mr. Watson to, to complete this application if it's the board's wish. Absolutely. Um, maybe is it okay to put it back to the component side? If I can. There we go. So the great thing about having grant applications ready um, and in the context of shovel ready projects, this is certainly one, um, is that we can build from them, take from them for subsequent applications. Um, we need to speak to the ministry tomorrow. Uh, they're aware of this meeting. And uh, I had a call this afternoon with the staff to further clarify a couple items. So we'll be working tomorrow to just finalize the numbers, 
but we are ho hoping that the final project number will be within the five, just under the $500,000 level. That would cover the costs of the commercial kitchen, uh, pending specific um, equipment needs. It would cover the costs of the, of the food safety requirements of the upgrade, um, which is flooring, um, wall treatment, et cetera, uh, design layout, and, um, and then the, the venting of the, of the uh, commercial oven and grill. So, so those, uh, those are some of the things that we need to finish out tomorrow in the application. The bulk of the application is complete with the exception of fine tuning the actual project costs. And we would certainly be able to come back with a final dollar figure um, with the regional districts team. And we need to look at a bit of those uh, class CD estimates as well and determine what is the most important contingency to put in. Okay, Director Hamir. Thank you, through the chair, a question to our staff. Um, would you have a recommended amount of contingency that um, looking at a budget of, around, you know, what we are under 500K, what, what that con contingency would look like? Um, if I could ask our CFO, Mariah Fort, to provide comment on that. You were involved in the first application on that, Matt. Uh, thank you to the chair, uh, CAO. Uh, so within the syrup grant that we applied for the original food hub, they had class A, B, and C percentage and D contingency estimates. So it's just based on how far um, our estimates have gone, how much we've actually vetted out the different pricing and things. So I believe, um, John, clarify with me which, which class we use for the syrup grant. Class C, I believe. Well, we, we exceeded class D estimates. So the, that right. application is largely at a class C level. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I think, uh, about a 30% or 35% value, uh, give or take a percent or two mm -hmm. on those estimates for that application. So typically through the grants, those are quite high estimates because there's lots of uncertainties at that point. So as you go through the process, you fine tune those contingencies. So I think you'd probably be looking at a similar percentage for this grant, depending on what components of the project you'd be looking at. I think, yeah, yes, that's a safe answer. Um, I, I can say that we'll probably be able to get tighter estimates um, just due to the components. Uh, some of the components um, need to stay at that class D for the original application due to unknowns in geotech and other items that we wouldn't need to be doing in this context. Right. So, so that we'd probably uh, be able to take them up. A little and, bit more. and this is a smaller scope project with less kind of smaller scope, less impact to to the surrounding grounds and different things. Director Killian. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if um, if we indicated support and principle subject to further dialogue between uh, finance staff and the project. Uh, to be brought back on the 24th, if that would be sufficient for the purposes tonight. I'll pass that question to staff. Yes, okay. All right, seeing no further questions or lights. Um, Dr. Hillian, would you like to make that motion then? Oh, yes, we are. Anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried. I'll move that uh, we indicate support and principle for the Food Hub uh, funding application subject to further dialogue between uh, staff and um, CVEDS uh, regarding the final status of the project. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll go through the roll. I'll start with online. Director Frisch? In favor. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton? In favor. And Director Grave is still not on. The, okay. And in the room, Director Hamir. In favor, Director Grant. In favor, Director Swift. In favor, Director Morin. In favor, Director Hillian. In favor. And that's carried. Thank you. Thanks so much for your presentation tonight.
Thanks very much. And thanks to the CDRD staff that have supported the process. It's been uh, a really uh, quick project to get off the table. And uh, we really appreciate Myra, Alana, Scott, Jason from, uh, from CDRD and working with us uh, in this regard, along with Myrtle Hall. Thanks so much. Okay, we're on to reports. And we have the Transit Management Advisory Committee minutes from October 8th. Any discussion about those minutes? Anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried. On to item two, Co-ops Valley Emergency Program Administration Committee minutes. Thank you. Those are from October 8th. Any further discussion? Anyone opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. On to item three, financial plan amendment transition next steps. Thank you, and I'll pass that to staff. Thank you very much. And if I could ask Alana Mullaley to come forward, there's a couple of items on the agenda here that she might provide a bit of a background for you and definitely be available to answer your questions beginning with this one. Thank you very much through the chair to the directors. Uh, the first item uh, in a series of budget amendment recommendations is um, related to our transition 2050. So you might recall receiving a presentation from us earlier this fall about completion of a transition 2050 strategy. Essentially, that's our efforts to try to accel accelerate residential retrofits uh, within the um, electoral areas and the municipal areas. So um, back in 2018, the board directed uh, staff to embark on a, just gonna get the right language here, a retrofit rebate program in our wood smoke hotspot areas. As a reminder, our hotspot areas are, have been identified as the village of Cumberland and the west of Courtney. Since, that, um, since we received that direction in 2018, a couple of things have happened at the provincial level, namely um, some reinvestment in a retrofit rebate program offered through Queen BC. So staff suggests that that program is robust, it's up and running, there is, it's well supported by provincial staff and communications materials. And so staff are suggesting that instead of uh, developing our own in-house pilot program, that we concentrate, or pardon me, that we redirect the dollars, the $32,000, to support implementation of this Clean BC retrofit program um, as part of our own transition 2050 implementation. So this recommendation is to suggest to you that we, we do that and that we do it as an amendment to the RGS budget. Happy to answer any questions. No, I don't see any questions. Oh, Director Arbor. Thanks, that makes sense to me. And um, I just want to say, I think retrofit is gonna, is gonna, it's not the last time we talk about it. There seems to be a lot of, of interest both on the, uh, social and environmental value, but also on the economic value. So I'm really glad to see this move forward and uh, some of the creativity around how we approach it moving forward. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Director Hamir. Thank you and thanks to staff. I'm really excited to see this going forward. Um, the, the retrofit market uh, or that, that strategy um, is my understanding it's not just um, it's not just focused on wood stoves or it, it has a sort of wider mandate to um, repurpose or retrofit from gas and other polluting um, uh, fuel sources or oil, I guess is mostly. The, so would, would our funds also be supporting that or are we only targeting the, the wood stove? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with either, but are we, are we um, putting any kind of restrictions to our dollars? Um, through the chair to the directors. I think you've hit on uh, the interrelationships between a number of projects that we're undertaking right now. And so this transition 2050 is something that uh, is happening with a number of governments on the island. And um, it's really the intent is about coordinating and peer learning um, and essentially getting the best bang for the provincial as well as local government dollars in terms of moving towards more energy efficient housing stock in particular. So the rebates that are offered through the Clean BC program include, um, you know, uh, uh, upgrades to insulation, windows, the whole gamut, as well as fuel sources for residential home heating. So um, 
As far as that relates to our uh, air quality uh, larger initiative, our three-year program with, with the Roundtable, we, um, we, we have a Roundtable meeting this week, and so we'll be doing some promotion of the Transition 2050. I wouldn't say there's a, a direct link between our wood stove exchange program and this Transition 2050. The wood stove exchange program, really narrow scope. It's really just about swapping out wood stoves for other air quality project, slightly larger scope um, that includes, you know, things like emissions from uh, uh, traffic congestion, et cetera, uh, as well as emissions that are generated from inefficient fuel systems. And then this is like the third piece. So lots of interconnections, staff, you know, we're really trying to um, it, it sort of work from that co-benefit lens and, and achieve as much as we can through every project. But I would suggest that these are, are slightly separate. Okay, thanks for clarifying that because I did have that confused in my head. Um, and just one other question in terms of uptake, I mean, are you, is our staff, um, our staff thinking that this is going to be um, taken up quite quickly. Um, and the reason I ask is that I know, while I know Cumberland and and um, that portion of Courtney has those hot spots, I do know there are areas um, in area B as well that also have shown up to be hot spots. And I'm wondering what the capacity is to grow and not just um, target those two geographic regions. Right, thank you. Through the chair to the directors. So if, we, if we're talking about the wood stove exchange program, for example, and, and, the, um, and how those hotspots were identified, no monitoring was ever done in the electoral areas. The monitoring occurred only in the municipal areas. And so I would say that's one thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about the hotspots. It's not to say that West Courtney and Cumberland are any necessarily any worse than other areas in the electoral areas, for example, but they weren't monitored and studied. So as far as take up in those two areas, the take up has been very, very low. Um, I would suggest that we were we were really impacted by um, by the pandemic in terms of our ability to do targeted outreach in those neighborhoods. So uh, I just reached out to Cumberland and Courtney staff to see if there's anything that we could do. For example, in the electoral areas um, through the utility billing uh, earlier in October, and then we have a couple going out this month, some inserts in the utility bills, letting people know about these rebates. And so we've offered um, for Cumberland staff and Courtney staff, if, if we, you know, we'll prepare the material, we'll get it to you. If it is an option, for example, to including utility bills. So that's one way to, tr to try to boost. Um, just to jump over to the work that we're doing with City Green on Transition 2050, they've given us some really good ideas about how to uh, get more uptake. And one thing we're looking right now is at right now with them is doing a heat pump workshop to try. One of the things we've heard that is uh, a lot of folks are purchasing heat pumps and then seem to be dissatisfied with them. What we've heard from industry is that often it's because people don't really understand how their heat pump uh, should be functioning. I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but it is a different kind of technology that people might be used to a thermostat on a wall, turning it off or down when they leave the house in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at some digital uh, things that we can do, but certainly any work that you folks can do to help us spread the word, there is literally money for the taking. <laughs> Great, thank you. Dr. Arbor. Yes, I, I think that education component is so key because the the dollar amounts to households is is big um, and the rebates sometimes they're just a, an incentive but yeah. they may not uh, address the larger sums um, you know if i look at our house we're on a 10-year journey to retrofit it just to spread the amount over time and, yeah. and the risk um, and i i just i just put my light back on because of your heat pump comment right so for us the journey started by replacing the old wood stove with an efficiency you know, a good efficiency stove that took us from four cords of wood to about three cords of wood. Um, and then we insulated the attic and we insulated, started to insulate it underneath and, and bringing it to, a, you know, modern R values. And now that's bring it, brought it down almost to two cords of wood. And then we still have single pane windows and uh, the walls are not properly insulated. So that'll be the next huge project. And once that's all done, the heat pump will make sense. Yeah. Because I think if we had the heat pump now, there's just so much leakage in the house that it, it wouldn't work. So I think educating homeowners and working with them to understand that continuum and, and uh, that you can be on multi-year plan is, is just fine. Um, so thanks for uh, that comprehensive approach. Great. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I think there's some real opportunities uh, for us um, to move forward with our climate initiatives, but um, also with uh, economic development in terms of retrofits in the valley. So I'm happy to see this come forward. Uh, so we're still on receipt. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And there's, thank you. Any comments on the recommendation? Hearing and seeing none. I'll go through the roll. Start with online. Director Grieve is back. Oh, great. Director Grieve is back. So can we start with you, Director Grieve? Oh. Can you hear us, Director Grieve? Okay, we'll move on to. I'm back online. Oh, hi. Yeah, there's so, no hydro out here, and my phone it died, so uh, I had to charge it in the car. Um, in favor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Frisch? In favor. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton? In favor. Thank you. Director Hamir? In favor. Director Grant? In favor. In favor. Director Swift? In favor. In favor. Director Ira? In favor, Director Morin. In favor, Director Hillian. In favor. In favor. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And we're on to the poverty reduction strategy grant budget amendment. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Alana again. Thank you, Chair Kettler. Through the chair to the directors, uh, this recommendation is uh, one of those good news stories when we've received a grant. And so this is requesting that you amend the RGS budget to incorporate $50,000 of our poverty reduction uh, grant in 2020, and the final 20, or pardon me, 50,000 in 2021 to complete that work. Um, as you might know, we have uh, Urban Matters has been retained as our consultant. We're working with them. We've had a number of project team meetings. Um, our project team, as a reminder, all the municipal areas, CBRD staff, Comox First Nation, um, the Health Network, Social Planning Society, and the Coalition to End Homelessness. We've struck a very small subcommittee in recognition of the limited capacity of municipal staff to participate. Um, and so we're, we're working away. This project has extensive engagement, the bulk of which you'll see uh, start to roll out in early January. Thank you. Great, are there any questions? Director Hamir. Great, thank you. And thanks to staff for, for receiving and well, applying and receiving for this grant. Um, really great news to see this going ahead. My one question was just on the targets that um, are, are in the plan to reduce um, overall child poverty by 25% in four, less than four years. Yeah. It's quite aggressive and I'm just, um, I'm a little bit um, worried that, you know, that target, I know it's great to put big targets, but um, do we have a plan of how that those targets are going to be reached or is it more an aspirational thing? Um, through the chair to the directors, they are really lofty targets. And so the 2019 child poverty, uh, uh, sorry, the BC report card on child poverty, for example, identifies that we have 17% uh, children, so one in, one in five almost children living in poverty in the valley. Um, so that reduction uh, target is aggressive. The uh, strategy is intended to be action oriented. So we've included those targets. Those are the ones that are set in BC's provincial um, poverty plan, poverty reduction plan, and they're in fact mandated for the province in legislation to hit those targets. Our plan, I expect, although it's just still unfolding as a strategy, will be identifying uh, the poverty reduction as a long-term impact. We'll have medium-term term impacts and then some of the short-term impacts, which will be those very specific targeted actions. Um, we're not the only ones, as you might know, who have adopted this target, so uh, early child I'm sorry, the acronym is um, escaping me right now, but the through the child development, um, the early years collaborative, but uh, I'm sorry, others, <laughs> we'll say others have also adopted that very aggressive target. So I expect this plan is going to um, tell us how realistic that is and what kind of bold and aggressive actions not only government will need to be taking, but like local government, but also senior government, and then also from within um, the nonprofit sector as well. Thank you. Thanks. We're not, I'm not seeing any further lights or hands up on the screen. All in, or is there anyone opposed to receipt? 
Seeing none, that's carried. And there is a recommendation. And is there any discussion on the recommendation? Okay, hearing and seeing none, I'll go through the roll. Director Grieve. Are you still there, Director Grieve? I'll be in his car charging his phone. Okay, we'll move on. Director Fritch? I'm in favor. Director Cole Hamilton? I'm also in favor, thanks. Thank you. Director Hamir? In favor. Director Grant? In favor. Director Swift? In favor. Director Arbor? In favor. Director Morin? In favor. Director Hillian? In favor. Okay, we'll give Director Grieve one more try at it. Maybe you hear me just, now? Oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Yeah. In, In favor? favor? Okay, thank you very much. So that's unanimous. Thanks so much, Alana. Thank you. All right, so we're on to item five, the electric vehicle charging station installation and community first. What? Community works funds request. It's been first and seconded. And I will pass it over to staff again. Thank you very much, Chair Cutler, through the chair to the directors. Uh, this is sort of the next step securing the funds in our participation in the Mid Island um, Electric Vehicle Charging Network uh, program. So we had this opportunity back in 2019 to apply as part of a collective for funding from the province and the federal government to enhance our electric vehicle charging um, stations and network here in the Mid Island. So along with Cumberland, Comox, and Courtney, uh, the RD received some uh, grant money. And this request uh, is about funding our portion. So 73% of the costs of the project are um, to be grant funded and the remaining 27% are to be levied by each local government, each participating local government. So our recommendation is two part here. Yesterday, uh, we presented to the electoral area directors about using electoral area community works funds to cover our 27% amounting to up to $40,000 uh, for the installation. And the recommendation that uh, we're putting to the committee of the whole tonight is that uh, the RGS budget be amended to incorporate transfer of those electoral area community works dollars to the RGS budget in order to um, uh, cover our costs. The costs or the payment, pardon me, will be going to the regional district of Nanaimo as the lead applicant. So as lead applicant, they're sort of fronting our little group of governments. Um, and so it will be a government to government transfer that we expect will happen before year end. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Director Arbor. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll support the recommendation, but just for the benefit of the, the directors at ESC yesterday, uh, we did have a quick discussion and that came up at Sports Commission today as well around the EV station. Some of the sites that were listed um, and Jennifer Spinner was there was um, the Sports Center and the Aquatic Center. Um, and uh, I think there was some discussion around maybe looking at Black Creek and um, as opposed to the exhibition ground. And there's one I'm missing. Uh, there's another one. My comment was, um, even though the grant supports mostly level two stations, I asked if staff could, uh, it was not a right, it didn't get formalized into recommendation, but to look at whether there was partnership opportunities um, to look at in terms of turning those level two stations into fast charging stations um, at those venues. So. Um, just for that awareness, I think that that would be very valuable to look at, especially with the way the, the market and, and new EV vehicles are going. Thank you. And Director Grant. Yeah, thanks. And I'm, I'm, this is a good recommendation. I just, I always have this question as to how we pick where we're going to put these things. And are we putting, putting them in the appropriate spots or are we just putting them where we think they might be good? And, and I'd look back to in our community where we've got one at our fire hall around the back. I'm not really sure that it's gonna get a whole lot of use. And, that, and it always strikes me that we might've been able to found a better location for those. So I, I'm not sure whether we're just picking them or whether we actually have a plan and a strategy and, and some idea of where they should go. Uh, through the chair to the directors, just, just to your comment, Director Grant, um, 
I think when this application was made, the, the criteria was that each, uh, uh, each local government identify options for publicly owned sites. And so the board identified these four public sites. Um, as Director Arbor has noted, there was some discussion yesterday about couldn't we look at this a little more closely. So part of our work on that Mid-Island Collective is ensuring that we actually are building a Mid-Island network of level two chargers. And so at our next meeting, which is scheduled for uh, December, um, we'll be looking at all of the sites. And I expect that there will be this conversation happening. Locally, I've been in touch with both Comox staff and Courtney staff to see if we can do a little bit of coordination and thinking, if not for these stations, but certainly as we go forward. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that I'm not sure that we're the right body to be deciding where to put these things. If you were gonna build a gas station, you would do studies, there would be zoning, there would be all sorts of issues. You would yeah. pick the exact right spot where it's most needed. You wouldn't come to this board and say, well, let's just put one over there. So I, I guess in the long run, I think we really need to start having a look at what the best plan and, and locations for these things are. And, and it's probably not a discussion for now, but just something that I think we need to put our mind to. Uh, through the chair to the directors, uh, very happy. I, I was remiss in noting that the um, BC Community Energy Association is coordinating this application for us, and they'll be doing a joint procurement process. And part of that, as you know, involves bringing in the experts to tell us whether the sites that have been identified at the local government level based on our ownership of lands and uh, is actually appropriate and makes good sense. So indeed, you're right. Um, back in 2018 or perhaps early 2019, this board directed staff to do uh, an EV network plan. We still have that on the books. And so we're hoping that this project could be a bit of a springboard for, for doing that. Thank you. Great, Director Ar oh, no. Director Morin. Oh, I was just going to add that I'm sure that there'd be stakeholder um, yes. connection, like there's a Comox Valley um, Electric Car Owners Association that has a ton of members and getting that kind of feedback, I'm sure is part of the process, I would think. That's correct, thank you. Thanks. And Director Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I would uh, agree with Director Grant and just add that, um, in general, as someone who's used an electric vehicle for many years, that uh, locations where people go already for uh, economic uh, reasons or even just for um, uh, recreation, such as near your rec center in Comox, uh, would be a good location um, and on main thoroughfares. So I'll just add that in for fun. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I um, was on the um, Vancouver Island Coastal Communities um, Climate Action Group uh, recently, and uh, we talked about, about this, and I'm very happy to uh, see that we're working with uh, other regional partners and, and uh, coming up with an island-wide um, uh, transportation grid um, for electric vehicles. I think that's really important for us moving forward. So thanks so much. Thank you. So is there anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried and there's a recommendation. Okay, any comments or questions on the recommendation? Seeing none, I'll go through the roll. Director Grieve, are you there? Director Okay, Fresh. I'm unmuted. Oh, there you are. Yep, no, it took a while. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Director Frisch. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. Sorry, I didn't hear your response. Director Cole Hamilton. In, in favor, yes. Thank you. Director Hamir. Director Grant. In favor. Director Swift. In favor, Director Arbor. In favor, Director Warren. In favor, Director Hillian. In favor, thank you. And we're on to, oh, thank you again, Alana. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're on to item six, which is the Union of BC Municipalities Community Energy Preparedness Fund Grant Budget Amendment. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to the directors, thank you very much. 
You might be wondering why this recommendation to amend the rural planning service budget is in front of you tonight. Um, and the reason is because although it is a vote of the rural directors when the item hits the board table, it does have some regional implications that we thought we might make you aware of, particularly relative to some work that the city of Courtney has underway uh, and, and planned. So as I said, this is a recommendation to um, amend the Rural Planning Service uh, budget to incorporate a grant that we received in the amount of $150,000 to complete a coastal flood adaptation strategy. We're thinking about this as the second phase of our coastal flood work. Um, since 2018, we've been doing a coastal flood mapping project. And although that was technically an electoral area initiative or project, we were able to um, uh, obtain sufficient funding to map our entire coast, uh, including the municipal areas, uh, Denman and Hornby, Comox First Nation, and um, D&D lands. And so we, we've ended up, we're getting, the, the deliverables are, are trickling in now, we're getting some really, really rich data that all um, of those parties will be able to build on and, and determine how you want to use them as you go forward with subsequent um, adaptation and flood planning initiatives. So on this ground, as I say, this is our phase two, um, our goal with this project is to understand what we do about all of the flood risks that were identified in our phase one. So this project is being coordinated internally in the CBRD, uh, but pulls in staff from emergency services as well as engineering and uh, asset management. We're working with KFN on this phase two as a project partner, and KFN has indicated uh, that their engagement will actively begin as soon as we have a consultant in place. We have an active procurement process uh, underway presently that closes next week. And so our hope is to have a consultant in place and hit the ground running with us in early December. The project will um, uh, involve a lot of engagement. This will be, this will be enga engagement heavy. Essentially, it's about identifying the values of the community. What do we want to do? So now that we know that we've mapped hazards, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us in different areas along our coast? And how are we going to plan for resilience going forward? We have connected with City of Courtney staff in the engineering department as well as planning um, and with the City of Courtney's consultant uh, urban systems. And we're working to provide early access to our phase one findings to Courtney staff to support their project work, specifically your dike replacement study and your flood management strategy. On the planning side, we're also providing all of uh, the mapping to uh, Courtney planning staff to consider how um, uh, OCP policy around sea level rise uh, may be affected. So uh, together, we've committed, CBRD staff and Courtney staff, we've committed to sharing information as we receive it and, and finding the best ways uh, to communicate all of this to our, our mutual public as well as our uh, electoral area public and municipal public. I'm happy to answer any further questions. Great, thank you. Director Arbor. Thank you, Mike. Um, obviously, I support this. The, my, my first question was, um, well, my only question is around the first portion of the project, um, uh, which was the mapping the, um, the actual uh, flooding risks in the floodplain. I remember when you were working on the project plan a year ago, um, we had discussed the, the potential to uh, put the data and make it available on IMAP. And every day since, after I have my tea in the morning, I go in and refresh IMAP to see if we have the layers and the, the projection. So I just wonder if we could have a, an update on whether that information will be made public. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to the directors, I am equally excited about those layers. And um, our GIS staff has been really working really closely with the uh, GIS consultant to build those layers. So I'm sorry, I don't have a date for you. Um, we have seen some delays, considerable delays with the project, primarily uh, on the consultant's end with some COVID um, rejigging that they needed to do. Uh, our drop dead deadline for the consultants is December 31st. So my hope is January 1, you'll have that tea and see those layers. Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Alana. I'm uh, I'm just so pleased. I think often climate change can just get put in a box over in the corner and um, isolated from other things. And I, when I hear the number of departments and uh, services within the RD that are working together, and the way in which you're seamlessly sharing and integrating information between the, uh, the communities in the Comox Valley, it just uh, I think this is just exactly what we need to do doing it heading into the future. I just wanted to uh, anyway, just thank you for all this good work and not. January 1st, I'll also make a cup of tea and uh, look forward to seeing the data. So thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, we couldn't hear all of what you were saying, Director. Um, it was a bit broken up, but um, I don't think that there was a question in there, so. There wasn't a question, but I'll make sure I hold the mic a little closer to my mouth. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Director Hamir. Thank you, and also very supportive. So thank you to staff for um, ensuring that we're moving on to sort of a, a second phase. Um, I'm just wondering if um, staff have already given an idea around what those potential responses could be. Like, do you have that um, already set out? Is that something that the consultant will be um, developing with you? Uh, through the chair to the directors, uh, the consultant will be developing that with us and the community. So because it is such a value-based assessment, um, we'll, there will be a decision matrix is the, lot, is the language that our engineering uh, staff use around identifying what are, the, or what are the series of options for given areas and then what, how do we want to proceed? So that is a key piece that will happen early on in the engagement. Great, okay. It sounds like it's gonna be tailored to each community or neighborhood or do you have a vast, a giant matrix? Uh, through the chair to the directors, we've asked the, the, um, any proponents in the RFP to propose an engagement uh, plan and, and strategy. Uh, our early thoughts would be that it would likely be neighborhood based, but also um, uh, like, for example, where we have assets, uh, we'd also have that lens. So some of our stakeholders, BC Hydro, you know, municipal areas, CBRD, where we own assets, um, that would also be an important consideration within that decision matrix. Great, thanks. I look forward to the report. Thank you. Director Helian. Thanks, Chair. I just want to say how impressed I am with all the uh, work uh, done by staff in relation to these um, all these projects that we've addressed today and uh, both in uh, accessing the grants in the first place and uh, all the work that's required to, in the implementation stages. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of excellent work and uh, really appreciate uh, our staff's engagement in these projects. Thank you. Thanks very much. Absolutely, and it um, takes so much collaboration uh, for all of these, and uh, certainly with the uh, coastal mapping as well. Um, you know, different areas uh, and regions, um, and even our KFN partners are getting um, uh, this kind of mapping done as well. So to be able to piece it all together at the end, I think will be really important. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how, how the areas differ. Um, it's not all the uniform rise in all areas because of tectonic um, plates and the movement. Um, some areas are actually having a um, uh, decrease in, in uh, coastal flooding. So it's just uh, really interesting to, to see this work and uh, it'll be fun to uh, have it all pieced together so that we can uh, do some proper planning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried and there's a recommendation. Thank you. Any discussion on the recommendation? Seeing and hearing none, I will go through the roll. <laughs> Director Grieve. In favor. Thank you. Director Fresh. Oh, I think it's the ACs, but oh, sorry. I, I'm in favor. Yes. <laughs> My apologies, just the areas. Uh, Director Hermia? In favor. And Director Arbor? In favor. Thank you. And we're on to item seven. Thanks again, Alana. Thank you. Thank you. That's a Union Bay Improvement District conversion study. And I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And I'll ask Alana to please give up the mic and uh, bring James Warren on to, uh, to discuss and give you a bit of an update with respect to the Union Bay conversion. Thanks, Russell. To the, uh, to the, to the board, good evening. Uh, just a really quick update on the Union Bay Improvement District conversion study. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when the last time was that I presented to you, but since then we have completed a draft report taking that to the community in a form of um, uh, a virtual session and an in-person session as well at the community hall. Um, there, was, there was limited uh, participation at the in-person session, about 10 or 12 people uh, attended. And then uh, on the virtual session, we probably had upwards of 30, I think, attending at one point. So um, fairly good dialogue with those that did attend. The comments and questions and some of that material was incorporated into a final report, which we've attached to this uh, staff report today. The, uh, the Union Bay Improvement District itself will be holding a referendum on November 28th, and uh, they've had 
I think they've had two days of advanced voting now, and I understand turnout has been has been fairly steady. And so uh, Union Bay Improvement District will announce those results following November 28th, and then we will be back to the board to present the results and um, and uh, consider the impact of that. Um, should the referendum support conversion, then the board will be recommended to also support that conversion and transition for the improvement district would occur in mid 2021. Uh, happy to take any questions that you may have at this point. We do have a question from Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. Um, should the uh, uh, referendum uh, uh, approve um, being taken in by the, the regional district, how much uh, work will that involve for staff? And is there um, any uh, funding available anywhere to uh, assist with that? Yeah, thanks for that. There, there, uh, it, it'll be a significant amount of work. Um, the transition itself uh, will include uh, understanding the systems and, and a, a lot of work has been done to, to develop some understanding already uh, in, in engaging with the, the staff. Um, the, the records keeping alone, transition of those materials. So there's a significant amount of work certainly in a, in a transition. There is uh, some limited funding that's available from the ministry for, for these kinds of uh, restructures. Of course, the ministry has been supportive already in the conversion study that has funded the work you're seeing here today. Uh, and then if the transition does occur, there's some additional funding that's available. So we would be applying to, to whatever is available. Um, and then of course, if there are three new services established, any funds that uh, are required for those, for those services would be built into a financial plan and, and funded from, from, from those services. Okay, uh, do we have any concerns about our capacity to manage uh, this if it uh, takes place, given all the other uh, um, tasks at hand? Yeah, we, we're certainly uh, very much aware of the other, other priorities, particularly in the water services with a new water treatment system, new water treatment plant that, that's under construction right now and commissioning uh, mid-year in 2021. And so that is part of the consideration in having a, a mid-2021 transition as well. Um, the resources and, and the service for Union Bay would be um, you know, kept intact and, and there are operators with Union Bay that we would be um, inheriting as well. And so, so delivering the waters, the, the water supply with Union Bay, it would, it would continue on as its own service. Uh, and we would, we would be uh, keeping distinct the Kamas Valley Water Treatment Plant as its own, its own service um, for a length of time until there's, there's comfort and awareness to possibly blend those services. Thanks. I, I don't want to be putting the cart before the horse, but it's just helpful to know these things. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any further questions. And this was just for receipt. Thank you. Thanks, James. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And that takes us to the in camera portion. Second. Thank you. And that's we uh, adjourn to in camera according to community charter 91E. Is there anyone opposed to moving a camera? Hearing and seeing none, we will